I was asked to give a talk to ARVO, which is an association of research in visual and ophthalmologic sciences. It's a big meeting that was in town here a couple weeks ago about, I don't know how many, uh, Ben's sister was a previous president of it last year. Yeah, yeah, lots of, lots of eye researchers. So here I am as a urologist giving the keynote lecture at this talk because they wanted to hear about the model of, our, of how we approach translational science. And of course, this is a challenge that crosses all domains of medicine, no matter what area you're in. How do we, in medicine, enhance the sort of flow of basic science uh, into ultimately improving health? Uh, and that's the full spectrum. And uh, so I thought, well, I've, given, I've spent a lot of time preparing. I've only given it once, and they only give it once. So I thought, oh, well, why not give it for rounds today? So that was the reason for at least saying that we'll, we'll go forward with it. So, so I think that you know, we need to continue to innovate in medicine. Uh, if we don't innovate, we will follow a Darwinian path of waning instead of waxing. We as proceduralists have to remember that. That's how ophthalmologists and neurologists share commonalities. How do we as proceduralist oriented specialties continue to be relevant in the future where the future will be driven by innovations across all these domains um, and where real expansion is going to occur and in many ways proceduralism will be forced down a technician driven evolutionary path as machines learn what we do right and that's ultimately the inevitable future so if we as proceduralists want to continue to be able to be part of this growing area we have to continue uh, to move down that path we need effective treatments in more segmented populations. We've been treating populations as an average for a long time. Increasingly, we're understanding how to segment diseases uh, that were phenotypically defined over the past couple of centuries to be better, uh, better targeted therapies, better biomarkers to segment. These include better imaging, new devices, which include robotics. And ultimately, this is all about precision uh, or personalized medicine. So that's good. And there has actually been this year at the FDA, the greatest number of drugs ever approved in one year was this past year. This yeah, is a, <laughs> cannabis, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's hit the FDA radar yet. But, uh, but this is 2014 data. And this line actually, um, um, did that show up? Anyways, this line uh, uh, continues to expand. Um, let's see where this. There it is. Is that working? Yeah. Uh, in, in 2018, up to 46 approved drugs. And yet, this is good. But the problem is, is that the area under the blue curve demonstrates the cost of development, and that's at, at, uh, outpacing the number of approvals. So, from a financial point of view, industry is challenged. And we hear this all the time. Diseases are being segmented. They spend a lot of money on a smaller and smaller market. And this becomes a challenge that, uh, um, uh, in the drug development world, which we as medicine rely on right, as tools to manipulate biology. And so in the research domain, we like to think of the value of death. But basic science is accelerating. Right? I mean, the technologies allow us to understand the fundamentals of biology uh, is increasing this area under the curve uh, on this side um, and yet our ability to move this into the clinical research domain uh, is challenged by this so-called valley of death and this is where we have to develop multidisciplinary team science to help encourage translation and so when you think about translation uh, we like to call it implementomics because omics are Greek for grant funding so you've got to be able to make up these new words, um, but ultimately it's a transition from discovery all the way through preclinical proof of principle and a clinical proof of principle. That's translation. The latter two, dissemination and adoption, are more KT, knowledge transfer. So it's a spectrum uh, uh, that I think it's important from a semantic point of view uh, that we use translation in, a, in, an, appropriate, uh, in an appropriate sense. Um, and so this is not a new concept. I mean, if you go back to the 1800s, uh, Thomas Chambers, who's a, uh, um, a, an English physician, uh, coined it as only the Brits can in a 
flowery way to gather from the tree of knowledge fruit for the solace and refreshment of mankind. That's what translation is all about. How do we tap into discovery science, extract from that things that improve human existence? And we've been doing this for a long time as physicians, right? We have been evolved initially as applied anatomists. In last century was the domain of applied pathophysiology, right? We've been digitalizing anatomy for a long time. CT scans was a digitalization of anatomy. Now we're functionally imaging uh, disease with PET imaging. It's especially true in neurosciences, but at least in the cancer field through targeted imaging. Uh, and the future will continue to be the digitalization of biology, right? At the level that we're doing now on the, on the silicon chip, but it will move through into a quantum era over the next 10 to 20 years, which again means that the, the, this, the pace of Moore's law will continue, not because of silicon chip, because that's going to change. And that's going to give us a, a whole new opportunities in the AI machine world and machine learning, right, which Larry's been involved in. Uh, areas that are, are again, disruptive right, uh, going forward. But this is all good news. The challenge is, of course, that we all confront the challenges day in, day out. Pharma has rising cost of disease segmentation. Public misperceptions. I mean, geez, uh, turmeric is way better, less toxic than the vast majority of your new anti-cancer drugs. And there are hundreds of turmerics out there. And we have to deal with the public perception that there's a conspiracy out there, that we're all in bed with industry that we just want to make money. We don't even want to cure cancer because, you know, we make money from that. Right? So there, there are these conspiracies out there that we have to get involved with, that we have to be aware of. And academia is challenged, right? How do we bridge the mind to market gaps, which is one of our essential roles in society. I mean, a lot of innovation, the whole biotech innovation spun out of academia. Um, and uh, how do we continue to accelerate uh, that, but there are gaps, which I'll illustrate, the bed bedside gaps, the commercialization gaps, the conflict of interest issues, challenges of healthcare systems in the U.S., the, the uh, um, what's it called, RO, uh, with, uh, what's the um, RVU, that's what it is, the RVU focus on physicians generating revenue for the institution that they're in, right, and that's the, the whole wheel that we're on. So. Uh, this is just some of the barriers, not all of them, and I think we can all relate to it. Infrastructure is fragmented. Uh, databases try and get outcomes data in this province. You know, we pride ourselves in a single-payer system. Try and get outcomes to compare uh, 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 um, outcomes data, compare differences uh, from here and in Victoria. Impossible. I mean, it just doesn't make sense in today's uh, information era. Uh, there are career disincentives. Dis impact factor is a big one in translational science. If you want to get impact, big impact factors, do discovery science, because that's where the big impact factors are. Right? The moment you go down a translational path of subspecialization, the, the journals have a lower and lower impact factor, and so on and so forth. Um, so the principles of translational research, from my perspective, has been focused clinically relevant problem. Again, you know, basic science tends to take their questions across uh, uh, many different diseases because it's biologically focused. As clinicians, we tend to think in a disease-oriented way. And for translation to be successful, you really do need to think along a, a pipeline from bench all the way to <coughs> clinical problem because the clinical problem changes by the time a discovery is going to get there. Right? The, the end game is usually 10 years down the road. But this requires strong discovery science and relevant models. It's bi-directional and iterative. Uh, it ultimately requires team science. And that's a bit different. In traditional science, it's all about the single scientist building his team. And it's all about his innovations or her innovations uh, going forward. Uh, so there's, a, a, and we all see it in the P&T committee, as you try and get promotions up the chain, it's all about independence. Show that you are an independent scientist. That's ridiculous in today's world, where we are completely interdependent. And what we should be demonstrating is a capacity to lead to interdependent uh, science. And that's where clinician scientists can help, because we're used to being interdependent as a clinical group. We're always dependent upon everybody around us and looking after our patients. So as clinician scientists in the bottom right, we bridge this gap. 
But ultimately, our systems make us look more like this because it's challenging. I mean, we're torn in many different directions and we're not necessarily remunerated for the science side of it and our time is not protected for it. So we ultimately have to align funding sources to evolve that culture, develop academic networks and importantly, industry partnerships. You cannot do this alone. Academics are good in discovery. You have to be able to work in real partnership with industry, not from a marketing point of view, but from a discovery and development point of view. And yet this hasn't really been happening. Clinician scientists as a model has actually been challenged over the years. And this is an illustration of NCI funding where PhD funding in the upper line has far outstripped that of MD funding. And this illustrates the problem. It's a lot easier to get R01s and other types of grants as a PhD than full-time scientist, science, as opposed to a clinician scientist, whether or not you're an 80-20 or a 50-50. And so the model of funding clinician scientists to help build these interdisciplinary teams is, is challenged and not being funded appropriately. So we began in, uh, uh, you know, as a, an approach to translational science back in the 1990s, I'd say that, you know, we, uh, Larry and I uh, were there at the beginning. You could say it started in 1993 or 94 as a small group down the street, but we actually moved here in 1998. So where it really began was probably somewhere between 93 and 98, but you don't really know where it began because <laughs> it just sort of happened along the way. Um, we wanted to build a team of programmatic, disease-focused, translationally oriented researchers and function as an academic industry hybrid to attract partnered growth. Okay, and that's a bit different because in many ways in, in academia, you partner with industry, oh God, you've crossed over the dark side, right? How do you actually manage that optic? Where in academia, the ivory tower was, you know, you can't be tainted by industry. It's a lot of good science that goes on in industry. In one way or the other, translation requires that type of partnership. And again, from a focus point of view, and this is important because it's in science and in medicine, we get pulled down many different potential paths. We said we're going to stay focused on mechanisms of treatment resistance as it relates to androgen deprivation therapy. And we use the model of philanthropy to grow. And Larry was very successful within our environment and, cattle and using philanthropy and what we did was use that to catalyze uh, scientist salary support. We didn't spend it down, we endowed it. The money was, that was generated helped bring a real scientist into our group, a real scientist. And uh, out of that, that real scientist was then often able to get salary support. That freed up the initial philanthropy to hire the next scientist. So that's what we mean by it being catalytic and like not using up the original dollars. And yet by bringing in, we were able to grow, attract what are called program project grants, which help shape team science. R01s, individual operating grants, don't shape team science. They shape solo science. And while it's necessary, you can't grow team science without program projects. And that's what creates programmatic interactions. Uh, our focus was on treatment resistance, but this is an example of, of a program project to help shape us. So Terry Fox grant, We've had the longest Terry Fox program project funding uh, uh, ever uh, across the country, but ultimately it allows you to create cores and individual projects that interact and ultimately uh, move from um, yeah, from uh, that doesn't work. So from tar target through to um, um, a clinical evaluation. I'm not going to get into the details, but that's just a, the example of program project shape it. Um, and from there, through program project, we were able to attract other larger program projects, including one from Ottawa called the Center of Excellence in Commercialization of Research, or CSER, which again provided additional dollars to help shape our organization from a functional and operational point of view into um, um, this type of paradigm, which is what we are now. Uh, a group of 25 scientists, over 200 people, and we organize our center based upon these cores. Right? So, uh, genomics for target this high throughput target discovery, genomics in its broadest sense, now increasingly supported by computer science. There's more dry lab space than there is wet lab space in the center now, because it's all through digital. Um, molecular pathology and cell imaging at its Large extent, not just morphology, but we're talking about functional imaging, 
and even imaging at the protein level uh, through cryo -EM. Functional genomics is the typical sort of biology, molecular biology, in vitro, in vivo type of pathways analysis. And from there, as we identify a gene through to a lead and a target, we then try to drug it. And as long as that target is driving resistance, uh, it gets prioritized to try to be drugged. And that's where therapeutic development comes in. And from there into clinical trials and, uh, and then spin-offs into biotech. And the whole point here is that you've got this iterative uh, flow where industry spin-offs create, attract additional dollars that then feed back into, through contract research agreements, uh, uh, the enterprise to help then support uh, the biology. Biotech doesn't have to you know, raise early expensive dollars to recapitulate this. They just turn the tap on whenever they need to. And then from there, we go out into human trials, which um, uh, exist within our environment, and we help biotech move through our, our, uh, our networks. The point is that each of these cores by themselves are not unique. They're everywhere. What's unique is that they're under one umbrella, under one organization, where they can be organized, funded, operationalized in a way to help flow discovery science going forward. And ultimately as well, organized into business units that attract outside revenue, big pharma, small pharma, biotech, um, uh, computer sciences, et cetera, to help to commercialize our services and products is another way to feed the beast, right? We have a lot of gorillas, we need a lot of bananas, where are we get them all from? And that's uh, a challenge because it uh, requires you know, it, traditional grant funding doesn't support this. Right? It, uh, it, it needs alter, alternative sources of funding. So I'll just now a bit of the background around biology and examples of how we translate. Uh, Huggins, as we know, Canadian urologist, was the first to credentialize EAR as a therapeutic target in prostate cancer, but we know that resistance is inevitable. Understanding these mechanisms uh, uh, now are at the molecular level. Right? The AR pathway is now so well understood, still a lot to understand, but what it does as a nuclear transcription factor and others in terms of regulating uh, uh, genes is, uh, is uh, in a canonical and non-canonical way, right? There are different ways that it functions beyond even this canonical route uh, is now much better understood. And so we're now able to push this progression curve further and further to the right. Um, we were able to capitalize on this kind of omics analysis early, Colleen Nelson, when she was here, helped bring in what are called expression arrays. This is now 15, 20 years ago, being able to create and print the first expression arrays here, uh, being close to Seattle where, where they really first developed. Uh, it allowed us to, understand, uh, to map out, empty the pond, so to speak, so you could actually see and then understand what genes and pathways were activated when we um, treated with hormone therapy. And here we use the neoadjuvant model, right? It's hard to get biopsies from metastatic patients, but we use a neoadjuvant model, pre and post treatment. Um, we had lots of tissue, and you could see big shifts in gene expression that included AR driven pathways, stress pathways, growth factor signaling pathways, and developmental pathways in driving this treatment resistance. I'm not going to get into mechanisms, these are much more illustrative. Um, and so, We've seen a lot happen over the last 15 years. And uh, uh, the treatments that were developed in late stage disease are now all moving upstream, right? The AR pathway inhibitors that were in the realm of medical oncology are now moving up into the realm of urology uh, in terms of first line castrate sensitive disease, uh, recurrent, PSA recurrent disease, and now neoadjuvant disease. So we have to keep pace with this or else medical oncology is gonna move right up like they do in breast cancer and completely displace our role as, as thinking uh, physicians as opposed to just doing physicians. And what's also happened as we understand uh, 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 the disease is that the disease is getting segmented. And that means that now going forward, we're not treating CRPC as one big lump. They're gonna get broken down into these kind of entities going forward. Smaller and smaller markets makes it challenging unless you have biomarkers to enrich. Uh, to identify which patients are more likely to respond. And that's, of course, the promise of precision medicine. And translational research is intermingled with this. Precision medicine is really translational medicine at the patient level, right? Real time. Uh, so it's different. They have ends of thousands. We're doing ends of ones. 
in precision oncology. So we're going back to the way it used to be before the ends of thousands uh, in terms of understanding it. That's the promise. Of course, the challenge is how do we identify these alterations and apply significance to them. And this is true not just in cancer. All aspects of medicine are struggling with this uh, going forward. So what's also happened in the last five years has been disruptive in our spaces to cell papers, including the one that we were involved with here uh, as part of the Stamped Cancer West Coast Dream Team. We now, through metastatic tissue biopsies, each of these grants were $10 million each, right? So $20 million on this one slide to create a landscape of metastatic CRPC at the genomic level. And understand that AR is the most common altered pathway, not altered at all before we treat, right? And there's no AR, path, AR gene alteration until we apply selective pressures of ADT. Yet in CRPC, it becomes the most genomically altered pathway. But in addition, there's PI3K, DNA repair, <coughs> lineage plasticity, so on and so forth. The problem is, is that tissue biopsies are expensive right, and inaccurate. Because how do you know which one to go after here of all these bone mets? Cost 5,000 to get a, a CT guided bone biopsy, and only 30 to 50% of them actually yield the valuable tissue. So that's an expensive and non feasible approach into the clinic. So, what we've been working on for the last uh, 10 years here uh, are ways to create liquid biopsies. And this is where Kim Chi and Alex Wyatt really led the way in our group creating a, now the, probably the world's leading circulating tumor DNA assay for prostate cancer. And this is getting commercialized in a CLIA sense. But uh, they were able to detect prostate cancer genomes in patients with metastatic CRPC simply by getting blood, which allows you to track it now on a regular basis. And we're able to detect uh, alterations that are um, prognostic and potentially therapeutically relevant. We used our our uh, JNCI or our uh, uh, Santa Fe cancer biopsies to compare the biopsies from bone with liquid and actually show that they were highly correlated and that actually the liquid biopsies outperform the solid biopsies in terms of predicting intertumoral heterogeneity and so that's an important confirmatory step. Kim Chi then led this, this is the world's first direct comparison, Abby versus Enza study. 101 patients in each arm, not to show which one is better, because actually in first line they look pretty similar, but to actually use CTDNA and test whether or not this is prognostic. And uh, you know, what we want to be able to do is pull out these extreme outliers. Well, the 20% who don't respond, the 25% who respond for a very long time, what are their genomic differences? And uh, at least in the initial publication in Cancer Discovery, uh, these own alterations prove to be very predictive for very poor outcome. So knowing this early allows you to shift to chemo as opposed to an AR pathway inhibitor, as an example. Um, this is just now going into, you presented ASCO last year, it's just being submitted to JCO this week, but uh, the second line aspects of it are interesting. Once you progress on Abby versus Enza and then you cross over to the other, Look at the differences. So Enza actually has a much better response rate after Abby as opposed to Abby after Enza. Abby after Enza essentially less than 10% respond. So that's, what this is telling us is that uh, the, the uh, uh, and, and again it's going to come out in the paper, is that Abby followed by Enza is better over the long haul than Enza followed by Abby. And the question is why is that? And likely it's because the selective pressures of treatment on Abby are creating a phenotype that is still sensitive, at least in subgroups, to ENZA. And we can understand that a bit genomically, and I'll get into that. But ultimately, what these plasma DNA assays allow you to do in liquid and feasible ways is identify alterations that are actionable. Right? So all these genomic alterations have drugs that can potentially exploit that alteration. Most notably, BRCA. Uh, DNA repair. These are now in phase three trials. It will likely be the next drug approved in CRPC based upon a, and the first based upon a genomic alteration. And then, of course, there's AR alterations going forward as well. But ultimately, from a translational point of view, these, the ability to look at this in a liquid biopsy sense has helped spearhead this national 
umbrella trial, which Kim Chi leads. And again, it illustrates the bench to bedside to national and international clinical trials capabilities if you do good science at the bench. This is now a national trial. Every patient with CRPC is eligible, gets their CTDNA done, alterations that are identified here, and the patient gets assigned to these groups of therapies. We're also doing this in a neoadjuvant trial applying across North America, just as an example. Um, and out of the translational space, we evolved our own precision oncology program that covers off all GE cancers. So the patient that comes in gets their tumors profiled, not just for sequencing, but also we grow them as avatars. They can grow their tumor in a mouse for future studies. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, and out of this, you can create, uh, uh, use these as resources for target and drug discovery. And ultimately, the genomics now are being fed back into a multi-tumor uh, disciplinary panel that helps to guide in the precision oncology sense. Again, just illustrating the, that translational science is increasingly iterative, not just in a bench to bedside research point of view, but in a real clinical uh, um, um, decision making point of view. So I'll come back to the AR, driving resistance. This is uh, something I would say our residents, you should know this gene. If there's one gene, you should know this uh, in, in urology. Um, it's uh, I've got a, a, a ligand binding domain, a DNA binding domain, and terminal domain. This is the most drug part of the AR, the only place that all our drugs target is the ligand binding domain. It's the most drug gene in all of oncology, as it's been uh, now, except for immuno oncology. Uh, we used to spend more drugs targeting the uh, cost uh, uh, targeting the AR than the other drug. Um, as I said, no AR alterations until we stress them with ADT or any one of these AR antagonists. And under that uh, uh, condition, uh, Darwin happens, right? This is just basic Darwinian biology. Uh, under selective pressures on this part of the AR gene, you, the, the cancer cell uh, amplifies the AR. It makes more copies. All of a sudden now, instead of you know, your one copy of the AR, you've got actually uh, uh, up to sometimes 20, 30 copies. Um, uh, or you can develop point mutations in the ligand binding domain that turn a, these breaks into accelerators. Or you can completely lose your ligand binding domain and it becomes constitutively active. And all these we can see real time with biopsies or plasma DNA. And this is an example of work uh, uh, illustrating this is again the ligand binding domain and all these mutations that we can detect they look like they're separated in space around the the gene but in actual fact they all crowd the androgen binding site on the AR if you create a three-dimensional model of this which our Cherkasov is able to do. Uh, all these mutations here that occur are functionally relevant because uh, uh, the um, the 742 mutation, as an example, activates, uh, uh, arises under the selective pressures of Casadex. This happens along with this one and this one under the selective pressures of uh, abiraterone prednisone and actually is activated by prednisone now or activated by progesterone, which accumulates upstream of abiraterone treatment. So these are, if you're on abiraterone and you develop this mutation, you are now driving the AR, right? Either by prednisone or by progesterone. And that's why if you shift to enzalutamide, that group of patients are responsive. Um, and, and so that's uh, at the genomic level how we understand. So I'll give you an example. This is a 56-year-old man presented with advanced disease, multiple bone mets, treated with charted, which was you know, an LHRH analog or antagonist plus chemo, and he was also put on biclutamide, maximum therapy. Eight months later, despite having an initial good response, he progressed with rising PSA, bone mets, bone pain, skin mets even, and he had very bad disease. And so we, he was a, a very active guy, and we went back and actually sequenced his cancer here from his tissue biopsy, and here took his plasma DNA. His AR was unaltered here, Within six months of treating him on this regimen, he developed two point mutations in his ligand binding domain, right here, 742s, which we know 
that actually changes the alteration of the ligand binding domain and makes casidex become an accelerator, turns it into an agonist, whereas enzalutamide remains antagonizing, but this mutation also makes DHT a super agonist. So based upon that, we switch his drugs from, uh, to Abbey plus enzalutamide. The Abbey to deal with his DHT, the enzalutamide to antagonize the LBD. He had another excellent response, but this time it lasted for over two years, whereas his first response, first line, was only six months. So by understanding the biology, we were able to control his disease for longer, but two years later, he was still playing golf, feeling well. We repeated his self-free DNA, which had completely disappeared initially, and now he's got a bad disease. This is, again, Darwin um, over time under the sector pressures of treatment. Now, whereas these were not altered initially, he's lost all his breaks. These are all the important tumor suppressors, right? P10, RB, P53, they're all gone. And he has 30 copies of his antigen receptor, and he was dead four months later. All right, so these are, this is the way cancers evolve, and we can monitor this now real time. And it also identifies how we have to better target the AR, um, and this is now our major, one of our major focuses, how do we drug the undruggable? Because now the androgen receptor, which was druggable, is now undruggable, because it's resistant to our drugs. And so we have to be able to target it in different ways. This isn't true for AR. Most of our therapeutic targets are undruggable. Right? They're, they're, they have activating domains that we can't access with chemicals. And so a major focus in our translational program now is recognizing that we're drowning in genomic targets. How do we match these with drugs? And so over the last few years, we've spent uh, a, lar a large effort recruiting in the world's best cryo-EM person. We've got a Canadian excellent research chair for this and uh, and this went uh, and we were able to bring him in to help accelerate the resolution of protein structure and this is our program now which is uh, linking computer augmented drug design with protein structure and this is really led by Art Cherkasov uh, where we uh, can identify genomic targets resolve their structure and then better um, delineate that with, with uh, uh, resolve the structure and match it using computer augmented drug design to come out with uh, um, drugs that then are, are evaluated within our traditional um, uh, preclinical space. So that's our, our program going forward. There's a few illustrative examples of this. This is the undruggable protein, uh, in this case the AR, and we wanted to target the DNA binding domain, which is the active part of the drug but its structure wasn't well understood. Uh, we were able to model it and then use computer augmented drug design. And this is back in the day, which is now five years ago, we had 50 million chemicals in our computer augmented drug design library. Now there are actually over a billion. So these are every three-dimensional chemical that you can imagine is now in silico. And these can be through computer processing matched to a particular shape and you understand then the chemistry or modify it based upon the interactions within the pocket that you want a drug. And so this is an example of EPC 14449, the first AR DNA binding domain inhibitor. It specifically inhibits AR, not the other steroid receptors, antagonizes resistant AR, including AR splice variants. And this was out licensed to Roche in what was at the time Canada's largest out licensing ever to industry. So it illustrates again the one way to create discovery and then out license to partners for ongoing, in this case, med chem preclinical development. So I'm just going to uh, uh, you know, give a couple of other examples, but this is how this space is changing. I already gave you an example of the AR is changing, so we need non LBD AR antagonists. And that's the future over the next little while. Um, we're already developing, AK, not us, but others, AKT inhibitors for this subgroup. PARP inhibitors will likely get approved in the next couple of years for this subgroup. We already have this subgroup approved PDL1 inhibitors for MSI altered CRPC. Right, this is microsatellite inhibition, it's, it's the DNA, um, the uh, hydromutated phenotype subgroup. 
but that only represents 3% of all CRPC, so it's not a very big group. Um, what we're continuing to focus on is uh, other mechanisms of resistance. I'm not going to be able to get through all this, but the area that we've been most interested in is the study of stress. I mean, this is the example, and I won't carry on through this, but I just want to show DNA and precision medicine is already at its uh, approaching a glass ceiling because DNA in, in insufficiently predicts biology. So there is a lot that goes on behind this beyond just DNA repair or uh, beyond just DNA sequence. And one of them is illustrated here. When you stress biology, right, this is whether it's normal or cancer, highly conserved stress responses are, are retained. And you've got then shifts where you think that the uh, RNA always goes to protein. No, because this can be blocked under stress conditions and only under um, a specific condition, something called selective translation occurs. Because certain transcripts are sequestered in these stress granules away from the polysome. And under stress conditions, you get selective translation of so-called chaperone proteins that drive resistance, and in this case, um, uh, pro-survival, et cetera. And this is bringing us back now 15, 20 years to research that we did using expression profiling of genes like cluster and HSP, which are upregulated by treatment stress. We now understand their biology. And clustering, as an example, uh, is a selectively translated stress adapter chaperone. We spent 15 years, published 40 papers. I designed a target inhibitor to inhibit it that works in many different cancers. Um, and then from there, uh, showed in preclinical model systems that um, you know, we could control disease going forward. So this is great. This mouse is saying, don't worry, I have the same thing that cured me too. What we do know is that preclinical models in, uh, are not uh, uh, always predictive of the clinical disease. But as an example of how another way to outlicense from academia, we outlicense the Roche compound directly to Big Pharma. In this case, we had a host of different therapeutic targets. And how do we go from mouse to man? And these are some of the challenges that confront academia. And to do these, all the pharmacology, the patents, the drug master files, the first in man trials, I mean, these things you, might, you have to add one or two zeros to an R01 to get into first in man alone. So that's a different model going forward. So we spun off a biotech company. The biotech company was then able to raise capital. They were able to come back and support our research, help continue to move the products forward. At the same time, we help develop these uh, 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 through industry partners and our clinical trials groups. We did a first in man phase one pre-surgery trial, which again illustrates how surgeons can get involved in the drug development world, because we were able to take the prostate out and demonstrate definitively, quantitatively, that drug product accumulated in cancer tissues in a dose-dependent way, and that the target was suppressed in a dose-dependent way using real-time PCR. So this is the first actually demonstration ever that antisense could hit its target in man using a pre-surgery well, in, in, any, in any disease. So from there, we went nationwide. Kim Chi organized a, um, uh, led a randomized phase two trial through the NCI, again, illustrating from a translational sense, single institution, first in man, go multi-center through a cooperative group to lever the ability to get what's called clinical proof of concept. And so this randomized phase two trial provides clinical proof of concept that adding OGX011 to docetaxel prolonged overall survival. And then from there, was able to generate three phase three trials, two in prostate, one in lung. And unfortunately, the trial was negative. These trials were negative, and for various reasons. They joined a long list of other docetaxel combination trials that were negative, and then you have to think why, right? Uh, it, it, all the biology made sense preclinical, and the clinical, but there are many other reasons why uh, these trials can fail. Um, I would say this is a, a, a slide that costs about 150 million. Right? That's, that's how much data and time and effort went into 
demonstrating failure in the phase three space and why drug development is so expensive uh, going forward. Um, I'm going to give you one last example, and that's the HSP27 story. Uh, uh, as another stress-induced protein, uh, it's phosphoactivated on these three sites to, uh, to cause it to depolymerize from large oligomers into small dimers that then do a lot in biology. I won't say uh, all of it, but it helps support a number of different survival signaling and proteostasis pathways. And Amina Zubaydi, years ago, was able to demonstrate that HSP27 gets phosphoactivated in this pathway to help the AR shuttle into the nucleus. So it plays a role in taking the AR, once it's ligand bound, to help with nuclear transport. And when you target and knock out HSP27, the AR gets destabilized and degraded by the proteasome. So that's great. We can show that in model systems. Here's just preclinical data that we're shutting down the AR pathway. We're able to then go first in man. And she led this trial. This is the first demonstration of HSP27 inhibition in humans, with again an antisense drug that shows that in patients with CRPC treated with OGX427 versus control, uh, a, almost a doubling of the PSA response rate. So that just means we're hitting the AR. That's all that is meant to show in humans. And we're able to show some complete responses. Here, a patient uh, with a retroperitoneal lymph node. Uh, it completely disappeared after OGX-427 is PSA then to zero. So there is activity, but this drug got stranded on second base because ogx one failed, right? Which means, because it's an antisense, antisense is not going to, nobody's going to give the 100 million to get this around the basis in a phase three trial, even though we have this kind of activity and biology to support it. So over the last five years, we went and spent a lot of effort creating the crystal structure of HSP27. And this is the first demonstration, still not, we haven't published it yet, but it illustrates that HSP27 is, organizes itself into these, uh, um, uh, in this 24 mers 24 monomers, actually 12 dimers, because each dimer is associated with a monomer uniquely, so it assembles as dimers, 12 dimers, and these are the N-terminal domains of the um, dimer, wiggling in three-dimensional space, because that's the part that gets phosphorylated. And when it gets phosphorylated by stress kinase, it's like MAP kinase, it breaks down into dimers. And we've been able to model this phosphorylation site. This is two dimers, a dimer coming together, two monomers, and this is the phosphorylation pocket now. So now, this is the first time ever we actually have a, a structure that we can now screen with drugs. Right? And so that allowed us to uh, identify initially just in a screening model. Uh, and now it's into the millions of compounds that we're screening. We've identified a lead compound. We have a whole sort of different bioassays that confirm that this compound is interfering with HSP27 function. It interferes with HSP27 stress-induced phosphorylation, so on and so forth. We're able to model where this fits in from a pocket point of view. And there's all, and when that fits in this pocket, then the, uh, 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 under stress, it doesn't get phosphorylated because the phosphorylation sites are blocked. And it means it doesn't break down into dimers to do its biology. And so that's great. We can show now in preclinical that, uh, that it enhances uh, uh, prostate cancer cell death by blocking HSP27 phosphorylation. We get preclinical biology not just in prostate, but in lung. So HSP27 supports oncogenic signaling in general, not just AR, but also EGFR, right, or ER, et cetera. These are, these are chaperones that help oncogenes work. And so based upon this, we can now move it into a phase one trial, and this should happen in the next year as we identify a new compound, and the protocol is already written. So I'm going to stop there, and I've got a, a couple other slides. I'm going to have to skip through it uh, just to end. But um, I think that you know, we've been able to, with this type of process, demonstrate that we've got over 150 publications annually. Great, that's academia. But we've done a lot of firsts in terms of drug-to-target discovery, lots of patents going forward, and uh, a return on our philanthropy investment. And so ultimately, what we've tried to create 
is this kind of a levered enterprise, right? So where the cores appropriately functioning help to lever the, the discovery of new IP and out licensing in the pharma. And ultimately that's what the translational science is meant to do. This is oncology based, but this model can be applied to other aspects of urology. Urology is small in the bigger scheme of things. We are a small surgical subspecialty. And as a small niche group, we can uh, uh, you know, we can be compressed further as change forces it, or we can portal into other areas and grow through partnerships clinically. And this is ultimately what we uh, uh, are doing from a clinical point of view as we grow our programs into other areas. But in order to continue to grow, we have to portal into things that are much bigger than us. Cancer is huge, right? Regenerative medicine is even going to be bigger going forward. You've got technology and engineering neurosciences, uh, immunology, et cetera, et cetera. So by training clinician scientists that portal us into these areas will allow us to uh, continue to decant what is a huge amount of investment in those bigger circles into our small little bubble and keep us healthy and growing going forward. And we can do that by creating these models uh, across all of our, our domains uh, in the neurologic sciences. So I'll just end by saying that I think you know this is a uh, there is no single model. It's very dependent upon your ecosystem locally, uh, but also on the disease site uh, that you're interested in. Uh, you need institutional good institutional environment because these programs evolve from the bottom up, not from the top down. You just can't say I'm going to come in and create a translational research institute. It just won't happen because it programmatically arises from. Uh, uh, the primordial suit of research. You need large functioning organized programs. Uh, key clinician scientists play a key role in this. And at every level of academia uh, and, and government, people are saying, how do we support clinician scientists? And it's a challenge because you know, nobody uh, has the right answer and nobody wants to pay for it, right? which, is, which is an issue. Uh, we need, you need to network beyond your own geography. Uh, and partner with industry. You need a good tech transfer group, and we have that at UBC. We're fortunate, very proactive. And ultimately, sustainability is a key issue, uh, and we need to diversify our funding sources. So I'll just end by saying you know, we've developed a great team here. The PIs are listed along the uh, left side, and it's uh, through functional organization into these types of core entities that allows us to take a lot of our ideas forward into the so-called unknown, the valley of death, and how we bridge that. I'll end there uh, and uh, uh, open it up for any, we still have probably five, ten minutes for discussion, in particular of how we take such models outside of oncology into other areas of relevance in neurology. Okay, so I put that talk together last night. Uh, so. <laughs>